I just want everybody involved to be happy that they're here, you know, including myself. But I have seen lots of bad business owners in my life, and I don't want to be one of those. That's the main goal. Scratch Entrepreneur, true stories of remarkable people who dropped everything to turn an idea into a healthy, profitable business. If you own a business, it reflects you, whether you mean for it to or not. Every system, every product, every experience has you embedded in it. Any business owner that isn't comfortable with that should run for the hills. The owning a business is like having a child metaphor may be overused, but there is, of course, some truth to it. The things we build reflect us. But I would argue that building a healthy, profitable business evolves quickly beyond the parenting metaphor. The thing about parenting is we're mostly doing it ourselves. Our tragic missteps and long sought after successes are mostly hidden and only become exposed years later as our kids grow up. The parenting analogy works as a foundation, but it isn't the house. Every business owner quickly moves from the parent figure and takes on a role closer to an architect designing the framework by which success will be built. But the architect hands over the design and then is done, that's it, so maybe that's wrong. It's more like an orchestra conductor, masterfully melding all the pieces into one moving presentation. But the conductor is handed the symphony, the roadmap is already there. Most of us never have that and probably wouldn't follow it if we did. I think the reality is that no analogy actually works quite right because owning a business is way more complicated than anyone wants to admit. We are parents and architects and conductors. We'll probably spend time as a secretary and a banker and a backhoe operator and everything else in between as well. As we learn to navigate all of those hats, little pieces of ourselves become the fingerprint. Even as we train employees or hire contractors, we build a story. Our brand ultimately will be a reflection of ourself. The best businesses look in the mirror, and at least most of the time, they're proud of what they see. Our guest today may not attract to a whole lot of mirrors. He's more comfortable in a world of flying sparks and heavy sheets of metal. His love for building started as a kid and grew through building low rider cars and motorcycles in the DIY punk scene. Josh Smith, owner of Clutch Fabrication, shares how he grew up, why he loves metal, and how he learned to solve problems quickly. We're glad you joined us. I grew up in the next county over, Greene County, and... Not a whole lot going on there, yeah. but uh, li- lived in the middle of the woods in a log cabin that my dad built in the early 80s before I was born and grew up just outside running amok and and uh, making things as, as a small child. And except my dad built our house. My mom was a painter, stained glass, you know, did all kinds of stuff. And everybody in my family is fairly... A, a doer, a creator of something. So it, it definitely has been around since, since a kid. Yeah. So your dad was always building stuff. Did he do that for a living or more? He was just always into doing that at home. He just grew up, uh, with, with very, very little. And so I think, <clears throat> you know, was a farmer, farmer kid. And, but no, he just had a normal, normal ish job. He worked for Crane Naval Base and, um, Mostly just blew things up at Crane. <laughs> What's his job? <laughs> Which happens with a lot of jobs out at that naval base yes. for sure. Um, for sure. Huh. So, no, he just always did, you know, and to this day he still tinkers all the time. Right on. And your mom your mom was an artist, like stained glass and stuff like that. Yeah. Did you connect with her on that? Did, did you get involved in that or just kind of see her doing it while you were growing up? A little bit. I mean, I painted a little, very, very little uh, as a kid. I was definitely more into, like, woodworking type stuff and uh using tools more than paintbrushes and and big into anything with wheels uh and still am i've got way too many 
things Motors with wheels. Yes, things with wheels. <laughs> Tell me a little bit um, about that. So you, what do you, you have motorcycles, you build motorcycles and stuff like that? Yeah, that's uh, the transition from wood to metal kind of started with cars and motorcycles. When I was like 15, I dug my grandfather's CB350 that my dad had taken over, uh, which is a Honda motorcycle, um, and dug it out of the barn and then got it running and was riding around back roads at 15. And, you know, (laughs) that's how I learned to ride street bikes and which I still have that bike and it's torn to pieces, uh, some day to be restored, uh, and, and snowballed to there. And I had a couple of cars and have, have always been into low rider cars since I was about 15 or probably 14. Um, and I think to date I've probably broken into the like 30 range of vehicles I've owned, uh, between motorcycles and cars and built several motorcycles and, several cars and trucks and currently building a truck that's ridiculous and so so the low so this is usually bikes and cars yeah. tradition it seems like it tends to be older model vehicles that are taken apart yeah. big engines put in them yeah drag racing sometimes and, and things of that nature or? we went to the drag strip uh, a decent amount my dad yeah. used to drag race uh, when he was young um, but I never got into it I mean the idea of just going fast for a quarter mile never seemed too appealing to me. It's mm-hmm. fun to watch, but uh, no, I don't really have too much of a need for speed per se. I was always the slow and low, as they call it. Yeah. Okay. So. Cool. So you're in, so in, in the you're into tinkering, to building, to taking something and making yeah. it into a workable automobile or motorcycle. Yeah. It sounded weird to say, but yeah. Okay, cool. And so then obviously we build into at some point you starting Clutch, which is a metal fabrication yeah. business. So how do we get there? Uh, I was a body piercer for 10 years <clears throat> here in town. And towards the end, uh, I was like maybe 27. And I was really getting into the metal more and mixing wood and metal in furniture and type stuff like that. And uh, across the street from where I worked was a little uh, restaurant that's no longer there. And a friend of mine wanted to go out on a date with a girl that worked there. And so I went with them to, to hang out with his friend just out of, or her friend. Mm-hmm. And that person, uh, his dad was a blacksmith. Yeah. And so we talked and then I got his number and we started uh, working together. So I'd go in at like work for him from like seven in the morning till noon and then work from noon to 10 at the tattoo shop. And then maybe six months later, um, I was in a really good place as far as our bills. Like my wife had, um, a good job and we were caretaking a friend's house who lived in Japan, um, at the time. And so it, it allowed me to quit that. And, uh, you know, between working with Brian, my friend, and well, now friend of seven years, and uh, and and just doing my own thing, you know, and then it, I went from, you know, the little slab in in Ryan's garage to half of a two car garage that I rented with my friend, who uh, I'm still like best friends with, and he actually works for another metal fabrication shop in town. Yeah, and then rented uh maybe 1400 square feet i think uh with a, a another friend jared who was into woodwork so we were doing wood and metal yeah. and then after that lease ran up uh moved to my current location which is like 3600 square feet so it's that's kind of how it grew now we have two employees well four if you count my wife and me and the two guys that work for us so, yeah. So you're doing the piercing. You you got connected with the metal smithing, and and you just kind of fell in love with the metal right away. I would assume, and then yeah. now you've just been growing it ever since, right? Yeah, and you know, I had definitely been like that was my decision, like or the direction I was already going was metal. I'm like, that's it. I just got to figure out how to do all of it, and you know, leave my job to do it. Um, and when I started 
this. I already had the name, like was kind of a side gig already yeah. when I met Brian and, you know, he was definitely bigger and busier. So he kept me, you know, and taught me a lot. You know, I didn't have any blacksmithing and that was the first thing we did was just, you know, I made a hundred scrolls and, you know, yeah. <laughs> things like that. So, right. Um, learn how to do the basics of working with metal yeah, in, in a blacksmith in that style. fashion. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I had taken Ivy tech welding, uh, to learn the TIG weld. So I had all that at this point. And, um, yeah, when I started, I did not think we were going to start a business. It was, you know, I'm like, I'm just going to make some stuff and it's going to be cool. Yeah. And then, you know, got busier and busier. And then I got to know that the, the metal industry and realized how huge it is. And, and, you know, it's, it, it just so much. And, and, if, if you want to change directions, you know, like there's so many different levels in the metal world, like manufacturing to, you know, our neighbors, true fab stainless, all they do is stainless medical grade stainless mm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and we don't do stainless at all. And, right. and the other shop in my building now, you know, pretty much only does aluminum. And, and so it's just, there's so much variety within the world of metal, mm. um, and styles and, it's just intrigued me and that's you know when i knew like you know i can make a, a real business out of this yeah um, what what did you love about metal i mean what is it there's you could wood woodwork you could paint there's lots of different creative things you could do you attracted towards metal smithing why i don't know i just like it yeah and um i liked it in furniture is really where i got started and and just working with it and and especially forging steel and stuff is, is neat to just take something that's impossible to move and then you heat it and it'll just do whatever you want it. If you're good. Yeah. Uh, I'm not that good, but uh, on that end of things. Right. To be able to take that and move it. And then yeah. it goes back to being unable to be moving. Yeah. You know? it, it fascinates me that the metal urgy part of it. And, um, but I just like the way it looks. There's, you know, it's a lot like, wood as far as like in the raw steel form there's a lot of texture and and um just variety in it and it's it is a man-made but it's it, it resembles more of a, a natural product when it comes off the mill mm -hmm. and can be you know we do a lot of just clear finishes and and patinas to highlight the 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 form it came in mm -hmm. rather than just painting it or powder coating it and um, so it's, it, yeah, it's just neat. And so huh. I, I still, you know, I think wood will be like my retirement cause it's a lot lighter. And yeah. <laughs> a lot easier to <laughs> like, work with. Maybe yeah. a little bit less dangerous. You'd probably. Yeah. Um, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Okay, cool. And, and so the creativity, I mean, it's interesting to see that you've, you've essentially brought yourself into this business as an adult that is somewhat a meld between kind of what your parents were doing when you were a kid. You know, your mom was sort of a creative artist in that space. Your dad was a builder and, you know, worked in that space. What I've seen of you all's work is really a mix between the two because there's an artistry to what you do. You're not always just doing spec work that someone else designed, right? Correct. Yeah. So the artistry, which side do you, do you consider what you do a creative activity or more of a process activity? I, it depends on the project, I think. Yeah. Uh, as, as time has gone on, I've realized that I'm, I'm really obsessed with like efficiency. Yeah. And I think I always have been, uh, but it stems more from being like lazy. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah. I'm going to find the e easiest way to do something, <laughs> yeah. uh, which just happens to be the most efficient way. Yeah. Um, I love efficiency and I consider myself a fairly creative person. And yeah. so I know that like when you think of creative people, sometimes you don't think of efficiency because right. it's this concept of like, yeah. you know, oh, I'll just go this route and mm -hmm. that route. And I don't, you know, but I think lots of well, there's lots of different types of creative people, first of yeah. all, obviously. And efficiency is something that a lot of us love. Yeah. You know, and I, I totally connect with that piece mm -hmm. of that side of it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it just depends on the project. Like yeah. I get into both sides of that where, you know, we're doing some tables for Cardinal Spirit right now where um, it is creative. And, mm -hmm. and I like that. 
and it kind of gives me that that boost when it you know you get into the grind of just doing you know rails all day or something like yeah. that and and but I like that because I get to make it efficient and you know that's my constant evolution is just make things quicker because time is money and mm-hmm. you know and I like it you know it when I figure a process out and make it quicker and or simplify it it's it's rewarding to me mm-hmm. um, so it just yeah you know, whatever the project is and we're definitely like you know I it's a blessing and a curse. Like people, most of my customers just call me and say, we need this and they don't provide anything other than just, we need it do it and do mm-hmm. it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's great cause I get freedom to do whatever and, you know, work, you know, give them suggestions and, and that. And, mm-hmm. but there's definitely time where I'm like, can just somebody give me a drawing? <laughs> well, and sometimes just, for know. some of the spec work you do rails for houses, some yeah. of that kind of thing, it probably is very much specked out where someone else is building the staircase. Either your work fits or it doesn't, right? Right. And that's, you know, that that's where it becomes a mixture of both where we have to go in and work off of somebody else's work mm-hmm. and it makes like our job extremely difficult. Yeah. Um, cause that's one benefit wood versus metal. And I've thought a lot about all the trades in, in a house cause we're always in houses and, and I would say we have the most difficult, um, out of all of them because we're always the last ones in. Mm-hmm. We don't get to caulk anything. We don't get to paint anything. We yeah. don't get to shim anything. So if ours doesn't fit, we got to take it back and modify it, huh. uh, which sadly happens. Oh yeah. I mean, I never <laughs> thought about it, but you're right. There's no cover up for the work no. you all do. Um, so it, it, it's, I think can be frustrating to builders. Cause I'm like, I'm not coming in until this house is done because if you put a tread in, a quarter inch too high or you know you you shim a tread up then all of a sudden we come in there and we've pre-measured and then my rail doesn't fit and they're going why isn't your rail fit and then yeah <laughs> we've we've got them most of them worked out to to yeah. our our requirements i guess you could say well when we come back we're going to just talk about business ownership some of the ups and downs pros and cons of owning a business We're back with Josh Smith of Clutch Fabrications. Josh, again, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thanks for having me. So what do you think it was that made you such a great problem? Well, I mean, maybe you don't think you're a great problem solver, <laughs> but what, what, do you, what, what do you think made you such a good problem solver? Um, I've never been formally tested, but I definitely, I'm pretty sure I'm fairly dyslexic. Mm-hmm. And I've done my own research as an adult, and it, it seems pretty accurate the descriptions and so that you know i've never been i'm really really bad at reading uh and so reading comprehension and you know reading instructions or reading anything did nothing for me so Mm -hmm. that forced me to problem solve in other ways so i've always been thinking of ways even to go way back like I'll, i'll talk all day long and uh be fine if you want me to read like one sentence, you know, mm. under pressure, it's, you know, it's, it's a no go. Yeah. And, uh, I get nervous talking about, uh, talking about thinking about it. And, yeah. And so when, when in class, you know, I, you'd have to read out loud and my thing would, I would count around the class and then find my paragraph that I was going to read and I would memorize it. Huh. So I wouldn't have to read it. So. Well, yeah. I mean, the thing that you're presented with as a kid more than anything else is school. Yeah. And school surround is surrounded. Everything is surrounded in reading. Yeah. You know, and so if that's a struggle for folks who experience mm-hmm. dyslexia or, or whatever the struggle is, then obviously the central piece of your schooling is something that you inside yourself feel you don't know how to do or can't do well. And yeah. so, you know, solving that problem makes tons yeah. of sense. Did, did you feel like you stuck out in school? Like, did you feel bad about how how school was? No, I, I have distinct memories, you know, like, uh, and, and I think the whole problem solving thing is like, I realized early on that if I didn't cause trouble, I'm going to get through this quicker. Mm-hmm. You know, like I saw everybody else getting in trouble and it's like, well, I don't want to come to school on Saturday. 
I'm just going to not get in trouble. And so, and it, and it paid off, you know, like there was one class in, you know, my senior year, I, I got an F and I got an F and I failed the final and I passed with a D. (laughs) (laughs) Just kept your head down. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it worked. Yeah. So, uh, So that's the problem solving piece. Uh, All right, let's, let's jump into business owner kind of move up into sort of current times. What's one of the scariest moments you've had as a business owner? Tell us the story of that. Um, I don't know. It's the whole thing. Me, me being scared is, is rare. I get, uh, worked up in a sense, like deadlines a little bit. Mm -hmm. Last year was a, a pretty rough year. Um, we had a lot of turnover in employees and a lot of pressure from different companies. Like last year was the the first year I ever actually left a job. Mm -hmm. Um, and I should have known better than take the job from the person. Uh, everybody was like, don't work with that person. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I got this. (laughs) And I was like, leave me alone. That is so hard to learn for any business owner. I feel like to know who, who to say no to. It's like this art form that I haven't, I haven't figured out yet. And. I'm really good with people. So I'm like, I got this, you know, and it wasn't, you know, like, of course that person blames me for everything. I'm sure. Sure. Yeah. And I'll blame them for half. I'll take some blame for sure. We were overbooked, you know, and yeah, neither here nor there. Yeah. But that time period was probably the, the worst because we had a lot of pressure on a lot of jobs and Mm -hmm. I was understaffed and like, um, you know, there was, like the one night, you know, one day, one night we had a huge install and just like tons of pressure. Like it's got to get done. It's got to get done. And that person's under huge pressure as well from the owner of the place. And, um, you know, like I didn't sleep all night and I had like a panic attack and I guess you call it that. I think I was up for like 30 some hours. Wow. You know, we got it done though. And, yeah. uh, it worked out and everybody's happy and, you know, as soon as it's over, it's all gone. You yeah. Know, it's, um, that's one funny thing about what you do and what all builders do. I like, again, looking at, I see all these pictures on Instagram, like mm-hmm. these beautiful things, every, you know, you put your heart and soul into it. And then when it's done, it's like, Oh, okay. I'm, you know, yep. unless Next. you're friends with the person right. or something like that, you're never going to you yeah. know see that again. It's such a yeah. wild, it's such a beautiful finished creative endeavor. And mm-hmm. then it's just kind of gone. Yeah. Is that, is that how it feels? Yeah. You know, and we're, we're in a, we've done it so much now that, you know, it's, it's, I've got stuff all over town and, I do like the commercial, I guess, a little bit, you know, because like I was at Cardinal last night for a minute and get to see we did a lot of work there and and so and continue to do. So it's I like to see people using what we've, you know, yeah. especially there because that's some of my favorite work we've done. And yeah. like I don't I had enough attention when I was the piercer. Like mm-hmm. uh, I don't care about me. I like people seeing my work and enjoying it. Like I'd love to sit right next to somebody on, on the bar stools we build and have them have no clue. Like I'm not the, I, I did this you know, like, <laughs> guy. Um, but maybe even hear them talking about it. like them not yeah, know who you are and be exactly. like, man, it's amazing. This and like listening yeah. to someone talk about something you created is such a neat thing, especially yeah. when they don't, it's, it's not an attention thing. It's just getting right. to hear someone enjoy yeah. the process. That's, that's my favorite. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, my next question was, what are some of your fam- favorite moments as a business <laughs> owner? Maybe those are just, you know, yeah. are there other favorite moments? There, there's moments, you know, there, I try to like step back every once in a while and look and go, you know, like this is my shop. Wow. Like I've got some really neat tools, you know, stuff I wouldn't have ever dreamed of. Cause I didn't even think really that far ahead when I started, but you know, our capabilities are so beyond where they started. And I still try to step back and, and be thankful for that and happy mm-hmm. about that. Even when it is like, crunch time and we're monotonous and yada yada yeah absolutely and it's a lot like the piercing world people used to ask me all the time every single what's the weirdest thing you've ever pierced (laughs) and yeah like at that point in time it's like after you've done ten thousand piercings i'm like well it's it's all the same like Uh it doesn't matter what it was it was just a hole i'm putting (laughs) in somebody and some jewelry yeah it's the people Uh uh-huh you know, I've got a lifetime of stories of people in that era. And then, you know, I like the people yeah. in, in, in this as well. Um, and in the homes and the, the businesses, you know, we, we get to go in. But the moments and stuff are 
are really just connecting with people and I'm just a people person. So, you know, I get to go out and, you know, I see customers out and about and, you know, some customers are friends and some customers were friends that became customers and you know, vice versa and, yeah. and just connecting with people. Yeah, that makes total sense. When it comes to the nuts and bolts of, of business ownership, what parts do you like that maybe you didn't think you would like if before you started? Um, kind of the same thing. I never thought about it in the beginning. Yeah. But once I, it was about three years ago where we really, uh, and I say we, my wife and I, mm-hmm. uh, Rose, she she left her job two and a half years ago. But before that, we were like, all right, it's getting it's getting serious. Like we're gonna, you know. We had been LLC for a while and, you know, we were just kind of very small. And at that point when like anything I do, I try to just do as best as I can. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm like, all right, now it's business time and it's time to be the best at business as we can be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, I discovered the ISBDC, uh, Indiana Small Business Development Center. Yeah. And I don't remember who... I went to, I don't remember where it was, it was something um, that was put on, I think, by Local First, if I remember. Mm-hmm. And they were talking about, and I was like, that's it, this is where I need to be. And we met with Terry Brown and and everybody there, and like they just changed everything. Mm-hmm. So as far as what we should be doing, what we could be, this, that, the other. And, and they're just great to connect. You know, They've connected with so many people. It's all around business planning, like helping yeah. to really plan your business in yeah. a, a efficient and clear and yeah. way. Yeah. And, and like Terry helped us write. And, you know, on the flip side of me, my wife is extremely book smart. Mm-hmm. I mean, it drives me <laughs> bananas because uh, we raced one time. I scanned a, a page of a, a book, just look, tried to look at every line and she had already read the entire page before I could finish scanning it. <laughs> and anything she does like with that, like when she worked at the bank, you know, she got above average reviews every year and, and she's just super smart that way. Mm -hmm. And so we work, it's way we fill in each other's gaps. Uh, So we sat down for like three days and we wrote a business plan and we, the, I think the ISBDC gave us a book all about it. You know, we open one page. All right, what is this? I don't know. I'd Google it you know, and figure out what it was. And then <laughs> yeah. we'd go back and forth and we'd have it done. And, uh, that cool. helped. And then we just have continuously gotten better and better and trying to, we basically just, I look at a huge company and I go, all right, I'm just going to start doing what they're doing mm-hmm. because clearly it works. They got somewhere you know? right. Yeah. I don't necessarily believe I have to know every detail because this is too much. Yeah. So she really handles it. And we actually hired an, uh, uh, outsource an accountant this year mm-hmm. um, to really take it to that next level. But that's great. You know, in 2018, we like uh, we got our um, Angela Parker is our attorney now, like mm-hmm. business attorney. So she wrote new contracts. We went incorporated. Uh, you know, now we have paid vacation for our guys. We're going to do profit share of some sort soon. That's now that Rose doesn't do all of our most of our accounting stuff. She is kind of the projecty like mm-hmm. I get wild ideas and I'm like let's you know I, I want to do profit share and, and figure it out yeah so <laughs> yeah she she handles that she and like figures figure, it all yeah. out that's cool um yeah and hopefully I don't know I mean I'd really like to have health insurance you know in the next few years we'll see mm-hmm. if how it all goes is expensive but it's not like astronomically expensive um, yeah so you know maybe two years from now yeah we might have something but uh, yeah, it's funny. We we were di- we were digging into like the creative and the metal and the details and the putting together, and then we come into this conversation about business, and it's like such a difference. Is it's a completely different world in so many ways, right? You know, it's like employees and money and yeah. and health insurance and all this kind of stuff. And it sounds mm-hmm. like you all are finding a way to navigate that pretty well, though. Do you enjoy that side of it, or is it just a necessary piece of the puzzle to make the whole thing work? In some ways. I mean, the money's never fun, 
but mm-hmm. um, I, I view the whole thing as just another project. Yeah. And so that part is fun to me. Like I like building things. So I just view it as this is what I'm building mm-hmm. now, you know, which yeah. like I said earlier, I'm not in the shop a whole lot. I mean, I'm in the shop, but I'm not, you know, doing a lot of the work. I still yeah. run the CNC almost all by, by me. Um, yeah. What's CNC? Oh, sorry. Uh, our CNC plasma is a it's computer numeric controlled plasma cutter. So it just cuts sheets of metal into whatever shape I want it to. Oh, cool. Like so the, okay. Yeah. Like we saw a beautiful a tree. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, that, yeah. the signs, mm-hmm. it's all mm-hmm. CNC stuff. So that okay. the worst part about being in this role is I hate computers mm-hmm. and that's all I do all day long is computers. <laughs> yeah. And emails and, and, um, this and that. And, and, yeah, I like the building of the business part yeah. and watching what it's become. Even when, you know, like I said last year, we didn't have the greatest year, but uh, having the ability to, to, to go, I, I, it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not going to have this, that, the other. And you asked about fear earlier, and I don't really have much. Mm-hmm. I, I try to keep a logical thought of, you know, I try really hard, so I'm probably not going to fail. But if we do fail there's been a million other people that have failed Mm -hmm. and I've been failing at things my whole life. So, I mean, why not? Just one more. It's just one more and I'll keep going, you know, and and do it again with something that hopefully works better. But yeah, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, I'll probably just quit before that. (laughs) (laughs) I don't see it happening anytime soon either. So speaking of anytime soon, last question, let's talk a little bit about where you see clutch, you know, five years from now. It changes, you know, like it depends on the day. Sometimes I want to grow and like try to be a huge business. And then sometimes I want to shrink and just, you know, do furniture because it's, you know, it's, it's my, my mood changes, you know, Mm -hmm. right now we're doing some furniture and that's, you know, what started it. And, you know, you get that, that feeling again, like, oh, this is really, you know, creative and what I want to do. And then, um, then we do a job that pays really well and yeah. it's like, Oh yeah, it's, that's nice too. <laughs> so yep. I don't know. I, I want to improve. I don't, I, I never had a desire to be like super rich or anything. Like mm. I want to make a comfortable living and, but more so I want to like, you know, I've read, I don't remember his name now, but the guy that started Patagonia, Yvonne like, yeah, something, y- something. Yvonne Chouinard. Yeah. Um, that's like one of like three books I've read yeah. was his book and like his company, the way it's modeled is exa- like, I love that. It's like, yeah. you know, really into employees and, and I want, you know, to try to make people have good places to work. Mm-hmm. Um, whatever it, we end up doing. Like, you know, I, I think we treat our guys and or girls if they're working, you know, whoever mm-hmm. as good as we can. Mm-hmm you know, for having two employees and, and being very small to give paid vacation and, you know, profit mm-hmm. share seems like I'm doing something right. And yeah. we're, we're doing something right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rose handles a lot of that and it influences a lot of it too. Mm-hmm. So, um, but continue that and make, I just want everybody involved to be happy that they're here, mm-hmm. you know, including myself, but, yeah. um, I don't, you know, I worked, you know, see, I have seen lots of bad business owners in my life and Mm -hmm. I don't want to be one of those. That's the main goal. Yeah. I think that, I think you just boiled it down right there. I mean, if everyone, including yourself is happy that you're here, maybe not every second, maybe not even every day, but generally happy that they're there, then you're doing something right. Right. You know, and that makes a lot of sense. So if folks want to find you, maybe they need a sign, maybe they need a railing, maybe they need some other kind of metal work, maybe they just want to check out the work you do in the social media spaces, how can they find you? Um, We've got our website, clutchfab.com. That's a little outdated, but it does have some nice stuff on it. And then Facebook and Instagram is, I think they're both at Clutch Fabrication. I think you guys do a great job on Instagram and that's a great place to show show off the the cool stuff that you all do. Um, Well, Josh, thank you so much for joining us for a little bit of time and uh, you guys are doing great work here in Bloomington and thanks for all you do. Thank you. You do the same. Keep it up. I like this. (laughs) 
Special thanks to Josh Smith for taking the time to share the Clutch Fabrication story with us. This show was produced and edited by me, Jeremy Goodrich. The music is by my high school buddy, Mark Vinton. He had a motorcycle for like a New York minute in college, and he let me try it once. Only once. In the end, he wished he hadn't. If you enjoyed this podcast, there's a couple of things we need you to do right now. First, subscribe to Scratch Entrepreneur on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you can hear future episodes as soon as we release them. While you're there, please give the show a review. We'd love to know what you liked, what you didn't, and what you want to hear next. Until the next time, we truly appreciate you listening. 